about was the story. You all sort of have a story that you work from. How do you keep sustainability from becoming just another buzzword and being the headline? Passionately as a designer, it's about designing in the value, into the object, into the service and the experience. I don't think you, you should be leading right, with sustainability. Uh, fundamentally, I think we have to figure out, as I mentioned in, in, in the thoughts earlier, how do we design in the, uh, uh, the right value for the right consumer at the right time? Um, we passionately believe that if you actually design good stuff, people will come, right? Don't lead with, with sustainability. Lead with uh, what, people are what people's needs are, what people's passions are. And from there, you know, if we can provide it and we can deliver it under infrastructure that actually allows you know, lower impact, that's the way to do it. I think this is actually a real challenge at the moment, which is that um, you know, everybody is deploying environmental sustainable messaging, right? And it's extremely generic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so from a consumer perspective, it's very hard to make sophisticated judgments between them. So, for example, you could go to the, the, the Coke Brothers website, K-O-C-H, not Coca-Cola. They're the biggest funders of campaigns against climate change. Uh, and yet you go to their website and there's green everywhere and there's, like, there's a whole tab about their commitment to the environment. And you know, it actually uses very much the same language as companies that actually take sustainability quite seriously. Mm -hmm. So you've got a company like GE, which you know, has its own problems, uh, but is actually taking, you know, really investing in renewables, in electric cars, in wind. It's actually supportive of a national you know, price on carbon. And yet, you go to those two websites, you have no idea which was serious about sustainability and which was actively undermining efforts to do that. And so I think it's a big challenge. And I think that the risk is that as everybody takes on, cloaks themselves in the language of sustainability and more broadly in the language of sort of social responsibility, that uh, you just get lost in a sea of generic um, stuff, which is why it's important that there are real ways, as Simon alluded to, of actually getting consumers to actively pass the differences, to police that, and to help consumers take action and, and really be you know, critical um, at, those, at those key points. One of my colleagues always refers to this notion of the do and the say of the brand need to be the same thing, right? right. You can say whatever you want to say. If when it fundamentally comes down to it, the way you're making money, the products, goods, and the services that you're delivering don't live up to that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ill-matched equation and using, you know, with the plethora of social technologies we have today, it comes across very quickly and people begin to, you know, vote with their dollars. They absolutely, yeah. they absolutely do and I think, you know, there's another downside to this. Even when companies try to do something good but it's not in alignment with the core values of the brand, there's still a disconnect in the consumer's mind and it comes across as disingenuous. So if you're doing negative things whether how you're making your money or its impact on the environment, but then you go and do some greenwashing on the other side, you rob yourself of two things, the trust of the consumer, but you also rob yourself of the opportunity of reinforcing your for-profit business model if you actually did outreach in alignment with the core values of the brand. And more often than not, my experience of brands is that they're frozen. They, they do some bad things and they do some good things, and they can't talk about the good things because everyone else says, well, what about the bad things? So they're absolutely paralysed. But there is one ray of hope, which is that we're incredibly sophisticated in our use of these tools. I don't know whether it's just a function of human nature, but even online, you know when someone's misleading you. And I think it's even more true today than two or three years ago, because look at the context of WikiLeaks, of all the hacking into Sony. There is no such thing as sacred privileged information anymore. And we've been reminded of that time and time again. Secondly, if you look at reports like, you know, Edelman, the largest PR firm in the world, their recent 2011 trust barometer, people trust brands now less than they did in 2008. So we are the most discerning, distrustful audience out there. So it's like when you meet someone and you don't like them before you even meet them. I don't like you. You're going to have to win me over. So that's a tough room as, it's, as it stands already. And then secondly, we are becoming so sophisticated in our use of these tools that we can smell a rat a mile away. So brands are faced with a very dramatic choice. Define who they are and do outreach in alignment with that and be authentic and transparent and accountable. Or see how deeply you can bury it or see how you can manage the situation or see how you can try and get other people to lie or to you know, delete tweets or doctor your Facebook account and then just watch as it blows up in your face. So it's a big sea change right now. But then flip it to the consumer side and like you were talking about the QR codes and, and the mother buying the milk. 
The hard part is for consumers to go out of their way to do the things. You go to the fish market and you have, you might have the app from the Monterey Bay, but they're still selling Chilean sea bass. So to use that as a metaphor, how do you, and maybe this is a question for Jeremy, how do you empower the customer end of it to be more active? Mm. I think part, partly it's a job for the technologists, right? So t if the technologists build better tools that, um, help make that experience better, mm -hmm. uh, then you're likely to get more uses. So the good guide example that Simon gave, they've got a long way to go um, to actually make that experience one that people are actually likely to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, scanning a barcode sounds easy, but, you know, I've played with it and the UX needs a lot of work and all of those things. It's a great initiative. But the point is that, um, that we need to build some of the tools to make that right, but then we need to embed that in a real... Uh, in a real story and a real political strategy. So it's kind of mindless just to have a bunch of tools, like we need to be sophisticated about, well, when is, it, when is the right time to target a particular brand? Like, when, you know, you know when is that going to add up to something and when is it going to be peripheral? Uh, what signalling effect does going after one brand have to other brands? How do you create a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom, etc.? And so you need this combination of very smart strategy and the kind of movement building lens with the tech tools that actually create better experiences that make it more likely Likely that these consumers are actually going to be turned into activists. And I think we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's funny, I, I, I gave a speech yesterday that kind of touched on this, and it was, I made the point that to a, a group of technologists and political folks that were all building these great technology tools for like um, civic participation, e-government, helping governments be more accountable to their citizens. I said, well, look, it's fantastic that you're building these tools, but, you know, if we don't build more of the tools that Simon is talking about, tools that engage consumers to take on corporate power and put consumers in the driver's seat, you know, you're missing the elephant in the room. You can make government 5% more accountable mm -hmm. and responsive, but if you do nothing about corporate power and you don't engage consumers in that, um, you're unlikely to make the dent that you need to. That is the big elephant in the room here. If there is no incentive for companies to change because they are still rewarded on the basis of meeting analyst projections in the next quarter. Everyone, whether you're a middle management or a C-suite person, hit your numbers and you'll get your stock options. And that hasn't changed. So why should they change? If every one of us in this room doesn't become more engaged, if these tools aren't made more available, if we don't realise that we have to assume some responsibility for that change, there's no reason for anybody else to change. So that's the Achilles heel of this hope. But it's also a possibility that exists now because social technologies come along and it's something that we can enable and make a difference with. Ian, I'd like to ask you, because from a design standpoint, with technology moving so fast, mm -hmm. how does a company, or for people out here who are designing things, if it's not ready, mm -hmm. how do you time it where you say, all right, this is the time to put it out, where you yeah. know that it's, it's up to speed? Well, I actually think there's been a, a, a shift again. I talked about this shift towards digital experiences that we're, we've, we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, I think maybe five years, a lot of companies were still they would try and design the ultimate experience, right? They would go for the full featured version of something, wait till it's finished and then launch. And increasingly we're, we're seeing digital companies work in a much more agile way, in a much more nimble way, launch platforms that they know aren't right. You're launching in beta and you're launching to learn and that kind of philosophy of putting a platform out there uh, with a certain set of functionality to learn from the market itself, right? What's gonna stick and what can evolve. Uh, is really key today. It's allowing companies to move quicker, right, and understand their customer base much more effectively. I mean, Jeremy mentioned about the QR code. No, what's the company's name? I've actually not heard Good of guide. it. Good guide. Mm -hmm. that, that stinks to me of like a technology that's being pushed down someone's throat mm -hmm. versus actually understanding the context and the shopping experience, right? Mm -hmm. And when would it be appropriate for technology to intervene, right? Because as we all know, kids, shopping, Right. shopping cart, my hands are full, individually scanning 25, 30, 40, 50 items. It's pretty onerous. <laughs> exactly. So how do we integrate it into the right moments and even the right experiences? Maybe you know, integrating that into an online shopping experience with someone like Peapod could be more you know, appropriate in terms of the context in which the technology is being used. So. And we're working this out as we go along. What's so wonderful is not only do we have a real-time focus group out there that as brands we can tap into and do R&D or test an idea before we invest in it, but you know, as Ian was saying, it's almost like you've got to make a product first and then test it in the marketplace. From a political activist point of view, you've got to sort of create some semantic web widget and put it out there and see if it engages fundraising. You know, from a brand point of view, you've got to kind of put a technology out there and, or an application and see if it resonates with your audience. And we, we're in this large 
seemingly tireless living lab where we're working out the balance between brands and consumers, between technology and emotion, between the status quo and social change. And I think if we characterize this period of change, if we compared it to the digital revolution in the early 90s, my guess is that we're like three o'clock on Monday in a week of change, in that we just reach a point of sufficient adoption of social media that it's being taken seriously. It would just reach a point where it's being sufficiently integrated by brands that it's being taken seriously. We've just reached a point where there's enough brands of sufficient size executing large enough campaigns to create the data that justifies the formulas, which means that you can justify it in the boardroom so that people can say there's our ROI and therefore we're going to change behavior on that basis. So we need to steer that conversation, but I think our sense, I don't know if you guys agree, but the sense is there's heightened awareness on behalf of consumers, there's heightened sense of responsibility on behalf of many leading brands, and technology is potentially transformative. Uh, my, my take is I think it could go in one of two ways, so we're at an important inflection point. It, it could all, so, so it could be very positive, um, but to me the thing that's really important to that is that we look at the economic engine of these brands. Mm -hmm. So we don't just take a brand as a brand as a brand, right? So you can be Pepsi or you can be, uh, you know, uh, the, the largest maker of wind turbines and you're on a level playing field. You're not, right? right. So if you're Pepsi, your net impact on the world is overwhelmingly negative. There's no way to get around it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're making people fat and you're using a lot of water. It's just objectively <laughs> true, right? And so your equation for how you do this, so you could do a great initiative like Pepsi Refresh, mm -hmm. but it, it's utterly marginal. Mm -hmm. And I would argue it's actually distracting people from the harmful economic impacts that Pepsi's right. doing. Yeah. And so a company like Pepsi, for me, should focus on internal transformation. So they have enormous assets. Uh, I think there's eternally some real uh, impetus to do some serious transformation to their brand. Um, although there are going to be constraints being a public company, uh, you know, to, to really fundamentally transform their business model. So you sort of look at those guys and you say, well, you know, the bar is very high and you doing a, a bit of distracting cause marketing is not necessarily um, actually something that we need to encourage. And so if we want an avalanche of that, we could all be kind of dazzled by these beautiful cause marketing campaigns that are utterly marginal to the, to the net impact yeah. these brands are actually having. Business. On the other hand, if we're doing it in such a way that we're helping to transform the economic engines of these, of these companies in really profound ways, then they have some right to do some marketing off the back of that uh, and to really um, champion those things. But I think what we want to avoid is a culture of at a peripheral, marginal, mm -hmm. so that the bulk is bad, but we're going to do this one little thing on the side that's good. And so on the, yeah. on the other hand, I think, um, you know, there are these brands that are basically engines of the transformation that we need in our society, mm -hmm. in our economy. The green, the green companies, the companies that are making electric cars instead of cars powered by, by gas, etc. So those guys, I think, have a right to do all the damn marketing they want right. and that we should encourage them. And so there's just that nuance needed about getting people to, mm -hmm. to apply those different lenses without going into a place where you discourage the big brands right. from doing some of the, the transformation right. that they can and will do. 